You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, Brian McClanahan here. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute for the week of January 4th to January 8th, 2016. It's episode 8. Glad to be here. Glad to have you back. We had a pretty interesting week at the Institute. And so we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about this week and a, and a fairly uh, important topic. I think more than fairly important. It is an important topic because uh, of the current narrative about the South and uh, the simplistic narrative that's often offered about Southern history in the South. And so we uh, tackled that head on this week on a very interesting topic, I think, uh, black slave owners and black Confederates. Uh, did they exist? Were they there? Uh, how many were there? Uh, So we're going to talk about that and tackle that this week. Also remember uh, that we have our conference coming up um, under two months now in Charleston, South Carolina, February 26th and 27th. It's the PC attack on the South. And so this topic actually fits into that too because the PC attack on the South uh, doesn't take any of this stuff we're going to talk about this week into account when people are are discussing it. So uh, the PC attack on the South is going to be a great time. Uh, Friday night we have a, a... a um, seminar, so to speak, with several of the speakers. And then Saturday we have uh, talks all day with the banquet at night. Uh, The uh, speaker of the uh, nighttime banquet is Bertram Hayes Davis, the great-great-grandson of Jefferson Davis. And his uh, talk is Jefferson Davis, Renaissance Man. And we have a number of other great talks before that from Tom Fleming, Don Livingston, yours truly, Barbara Marthal, uh, Kerry Roberts. So it's going to be a very good time. Clyde Wilson. It's going to be a very good time, and uh, we hope to see you there. You can register for that on our website, www.abbevilleinstitute.org. You can also make a contribution to the Abbeville Institute there. Remember, we are uh, an organization, a nonprofit organization that exists on your generosity, so please consider donating anytime you feel like it. Uh, You can donate for less than 5 bucks a month. You can be a member. Uh, We, of course, would take more than that if you would like to be that generous, but for as little as uh, a little over four dollars a month, you can be a member. Fifty bucks a year, and so please consider uh, giving a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. Okay, so let's talk about the material for this particular week, uh, and I'm going to preface this with a little story. Uh, several years ago, I was in my office and I had one of the books I'm going to talk about t- this week on my bookshelf behind me, and I had a colleague walk in. He wasn't a historian. He just worked at the institution where I work, and and he came in and he said, wow, black slave owners, I I didn't know that existed. And so we had a discussion about that. Most Americans don't know that black slave owners existed, and if you listen to the current narrative about the South, this is not something that people often know or discuss, because the current narrative is very simplistic in its characterization of Southern history. Now, This is not to say that this was widespread, that there were millions of black slave owners, uh, that there were uh, millions of black Confederates in the Confederate Army. It's not to overestimate the amount that were there, but it's to show that Southern history was a little more complex than what is often discussed in modern media. And one of the articles, actually the article we ran on Tuesday, The author of that particular article is interesting, and I'll get into that when I talk about the article itself. So we have this topic, black slave owners. Uh, We had two pieces on that this week and uh, two pieces on black Confederates. All of these pieces, save one, were written by African Americans. So this is not a topic that people in the black community are ignoring. Uh, There are people who are aware of it. But for some reason, it's not often discussed because it does not fit the PC narrative of the South. And so when you start destroying that PC narrative and you start making the South more real and complex and you start actually pointing back at the North on some of these issues and saying, well, okay, uh, what about the North in regard to race relations? What about the North? Uh, in in regard to uh, black slavery uh, or slavery in general before this before the war, 
what about what about the North in these on these issues? It's it's interesting how people know very little about that topic because the simplistic narrative is a self righteous North, a crusading North that was morally correct against an immoral South, uh, and it, it's just so much deeper than that. So it's important that we get this history out there. And when people start talking about the South, you have the ammunition necessary to say, okay, well, uh, your point's taken, but what about this? If you can do that, it opens up a dialogue. And it opens up a dialogue about Southern history. Remember, the Abbeville Institute exists to explore what's true and valuable in, in the Southern tradition. And slavery is not part of that. It's not, it's not what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We talk about it because it has to be discussed in a very frank and open manner. Uh, but what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition is the Jeffersonian tradition and uh, the Jeffersonian political tradition, the idea that small is beautiful, self-determination, local self-government. These are the things that can carry forward in the New South, in the current South. Uh, and so we've, we've talked about that several times on this podcast and on the website but showing that the South is more complex really does help open a dialogue about Southern history and I think help us have an understanding about Southern history. And, and the talk that I'm going to give actually in Charleston uh, is entitled Tear Down Symbols of Slavery in the North. And I'm actually going to get into some other things with that as well. But we, we, have, to, we have to understand how complex this issue actually was in America, in American history, not just Southern history. So the first piece we ran this week was written by uh, Kirk Wood, who was actually one of Clyde Wilson's doctoral students, one of his first doctoral students. I, I, I don't know which, which number he was. He was um, perhaps second or third. Uh, but it was a response to um, State Senator Katrina Fry Sheely of South Carolina. And she had written uh, a piece, Get Past Race and Fix Current Problems. And so Kirk Wood who is Professor of History Emeritus at Alabama State University, which is a, an all-black uh, university, predominantly black university, wrote uh, a response to that. The, the original letter to the editor appeared in early December, uh, and, the, and again, the title was Let's Get Past Race Relations and Fix Current Problems. It was in the state newspaper. And so Dr. Wood discusses this particular topic. And he gets into the point of this PC assault. And he says, you know, look, uh, yeah, I agree. Let's get, past it. Let's get past this issue and fix current problems. But it's not, it's not us, th those on the right generally, who are fixated on this issue. It's those on the left who are fixated on this issue. Uh, those on the right want to tackle real problems. Uh, and they want to look at things not through the lens of a particular politically correct narrative, but they want to look at things as they should, which is you take each individual incident, whether it's uh, you know a, a incidence of uh, of a police exceeding their authority or doing things they shouldn't be doing. You want to look at these things in as isolated incidents and say, okay, well, where is the was this particular use of force justified? Uh, if it's not, then these people need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. If it was, then we need to accept that. But uh, Dr. Wood says very presciently, history is now the battleground of competing views of America, past and future. On the left liberal status side, multiculturalism and PC are the new tools of postmodern and neo-Marxist history, language, culture, and philosophy informing a future America that needs an exaggerated past of slavery, racism, imperialism, conquest, exploitation, impoverishment, and injustice to provide the needed dialectical element for a new synthesis. That it is more fiction than fact makes no difference at all. History on the left is a tool of political propaganda to distort the opposition. George Orwell understood all of this a long time ago when he wrote, whoever controls the past controls the Controls the present, controls the past, excuse me, and whoever controls the past controls the future. Even further back than Orwell, Confucius is credited with saying, when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. This is especially true when freedom and liberty are key words involved, and constitutionalism and the rule of law are somehow 
left out. History is about what happened and why, for both good and bad. We need to understand the past, he says, and neither forget it nor distort it for left liberal ideological and political purposes. For the conservative opposition, traditional history continues to be sufficient enough to study and inspire and to know when it is being misused. And the substantial copy material to follow, which I did not put on the website by slow mail, points above are referenced by the views of other scholars. You know there's more to the CSA flag controversy when the same PC is used against the California bear flag. And last week we had an article about California. The California bear flag is a secession flag. Uh, and people don't realize that California was, for a brief amount of time, an independent republic. It was called the bear, the uh, bear flag republic. And so that's why the bear is on their flag. At the same time, CSA flag opponents somehow overlooked the American flag as a symbol of slavery and race before the Civil War and for a longer period. Now, people know this, uh, but it's always dismissed as saying, well, yeah, you know, the U.S. flag flew over slavery for 80 years, but they tried to, uh, to change that. And so we can, we can recognize that the U.S. flag did something about it, whereas the, um, the Confederacy was not looking to do anything about it. But, of course, this gets into the complexity of history. History is more complex than just platitudes and slogans. It doesn't work that way. And so that's why, after this went up on Monday, we decided to do a week where we would talk about this complexity of slavery in the South and of the Confederate armies. And, of course, Southern history is not just the Confederacy, and that's something that we, we constantly need to be reminded of. Southern history is 400 years. It's 400 years of history, beginning with uh, Sir Walter Raleigh's first attempt to establish a permanent English colony in uh, North America, which failed. But then you had Jamestown in 1607, which was a success. Uh, the first permanent European colony in North America is in the South, in Florida. Uh, and so... We have to understand that Southern history is, in, in the long view, more than just a four-year period. And that regardless of what people like David Blight at Yale University will tell you, and I, I listened to their Yale uh, lectures, his, his course on Civil War and Reconstruction. He has a lecture where he says, well, look, uh, the North and South were basically the same with the exception of slavery. Well, this is simply not true. Uh, every, anyone who seriously... Now, David Blight would say, well, I seriously studied the South. But anyone who, look at David Hackett Fisher's book, uh, Albion Seed, where he talks about this, these four British folkways that were drastically different. Yes, they spoke the same language but with, with different dialects and uh, different idioms, different meanings. Uh, there was more to the, to the language difference in the two than just a Yankee and Southern accent. Uh, and the Yankee accent comes from Puritan... Massachusetts, and the southern accent is a mix of uh, Cavalier, Celtic, and African dialects, in fact. And so there's something more to it than just somebody says y'all and someone says you guys. It's more than that. Uh, it goes into the way that people organize their lives and the way they thought about things, the way they looked at the world. There's a drastic difference, at least early on, between southern religion and Puritan religion. Now, that, that's going to be blurred as the Great Awakenings take place, and more and more Southerners become part of Congregationalist-type churches, Baptists and Methodists. At the, t at the same time, though, uh, Northerners were leaving those churches and becoming Unitarians and other things, or simply not even um, interested in religion anymore. Um, so you do have drastic cultural differences between the North and South, and those differences were there... Uh, before, I mean, look, Puritans had slaves. Now, there are Puritan, large Puritan slave owners in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, and so this is, again, in my talk in Charleston, I'm going to get into these symbols of slavery in the North, and there's many of them that people ignore and don't even realize that are there, and people that are often championed in the North. And I mentioned Yale University. Yale University. Elihu Yale was a pro-slavery advocate at one point. And here we are at Yale University, and uh, you know no one mentions that about Yale. Uh, 
So if we're going to tear down symbols of slavery, well, we should rename Yale University then. And so David Blight would be speaking at, I don't know what we would call it. Uh, you know. But it, the point is, this is a much more complex topic. So that said, let's get into the second piece of the week. And the title is, Did Black People Own Slaves? And the author is Henry, Henry Louis Gates Jr. Now, this is important. Henry Louis Gates Jr., and this was originally published at a website uh, entitled theroot.com, and it was published in 2013. Uh, and theroot.com is a website dedicated to African-American culture and history. Uh, and so uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. is a Harvard professor, and he's famous for the beer summit with Barack Obama. He was the guy that was uh, accused of being a a burglar, essentially, uh, and uh, in, incorrectly accused by a police officer. And then this charge went up of racial profiling and, and racism in police departments, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, Obama had a beer summit between the police officer and Henry Louis Gates Jr. A, a, at the White House. And this got all kinds of press. Oh, look at this, these uh, evil cops who are just racially profiling. Uh, of course, what was lost in that is that the police officer had a had someone call in and say, "Well, there's something suspicious going on here." So that's all he was doing. He was following a a report of of suspicious activity. He didn't he didn't know who Henry Lewis, Henry Lewis Gates Jr. was. He was doing his job, but still, uh, we we have Gates, who is generally considered to be on the left. Uh, he is on the left. Uh, he is um, someone who. Uh, teaches African American studies. Uh, he has been part of this Obama push to, uh, in in so many ways, make race relations worse in the United States uh, in in the eight years that he's been president. So we have this this guy who is part of that write this article, which I thought was just so amazing because he's honest. Uh, and even though the tone of the article expresses some surprise, or at least. Uh, uh, shock that there would be black slave owners, uh, or at least this is the this is the uh, the abnormal position, and you can you can see that. I mean, th- there weren't, uh, as I said, millions of black slave owners, but he does answer the question: Yes, blacks own slaves, and there was some large plantation owners that were uh, you know that were black uh, in the South. And it wasn't just for humanitarian gain, and I'll get into that with the with the uh, piece by Larry Coger in that particular book because I think that's that's um, uh, th- that's a a very good book about the topic in South Carolina. So he begins with one of the most vexing questions in African American history is whether the whether free African Americans themselves own slaves. The short answer to this, the short answer to this question, excuse me, as you might suspect, is yes, of course. Some free black people in this country bought and sold other black people, and did so at least since 1654, continuing to do so right through the Civil War. For me, the really fascinating question about black slave owning are how many black masters were involved, how many slaves did they own, and why did they own slaves? Now he points out 1654. Uh, in fact, the first case of lifelong bondage in North America was in Virginia when a a black man from Africa claimed that another black man from Africa was his slave and perpetual slave. That's the first legal case of this in the United States. So you had that all the way back in the 17th century in Virginia. And so, yes, you had black slave owners. And uh, you also had situations where... Uh, you had in in early Virginia history, in particular, when you had indentured servants, you had uh, potentially black slave owners owning white indentured servants. This happened in British North America. So was it benevolence uh, that had these people owning slaves? In other words, were they buying slaves to save a family member from slavery? Yes, this did happen. Uh, Free blacks did buy relatives, whether it was their wife, their husband, uh, you know, this type of thing. Free blacks, of course, did that. Now, that begs a question, 
uh, one of the things that you often hear is that black Southerners could not own property. Well, we know this isn't true. There are countless examples of slaves owning property, free blacks owning property in the South, slaves being paid. Uh, and even in the, the movie 12 Years a Slave, and in the book, if you read the book, the book is, is so much better than the film. But in that, uh, it shows that Solomon Northrup actually received compensation for his time playing the violin, uh, which he, he, was, he did so for uh, parties at, at plantations. But he received money for these things. And you had this, particularly in an urban environment, you had urban slaves who were paid. Now, they did have to give some of their wages that they would earn for being hired out back to their, back to their owner. But they did receive compensation. So they had property. Uh, you had a case, a very interesting case, in, in uh, South Carolina where you had a slave who was a horse trader and breeder. Now, this was illegal, but he bred the best horses in the state of South Carolina. And so people would overlook that and buy his horses. And he actually made a lot of money doing this, but he was a slave. Uh, you had, particularly in the rice-producing regions of South Carolina, you had the task system of slavery there where they were given a task, let's say clear two acres of rice, and they were done. So uh, the rest of the day was their time. And so you would have these, uh, these slaves go out and work very early in the morning, finish their task, and then they would, there were travelers who remarked, well, slaves are doing nothing at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. They're, they're cultivating their own garden so they can sell some product. Uh, they're fishing, they're doing things. And people would say, well, why, are they, why aren't they working? And uh, that's because they had finished their task. And when the Union Army moved through these areas of South Carolina, this is fascinating. When they moved through these areas of South Carolina, they would, of course, force these now freedmen to work in the war effort. And the system they would use was a gang system. You work from this time to this time or until we tell you to stop. And there was resistance to that because these slaves had worked under a task system for years, and their job was to uh, clear a certain amount of land, and then they were done or do the task. And they, didn't, they bristled under this system where you just worked until we told you to stop. So you had this very complex, even in the South, this, this labor system, depending on where you were, the type and location of the farm, uh, the type and location of work, you had a very complex labor system. Uh, and so he, uh, Gates quotes uh, John Hope Franklin, uh, who says, The majority of Negro owners of slaves had some personal interest in their property. But, he admits, there were instances, however, in which free Negroes had a real economic interest in the institution of slavery and held slaves in order to improve their economic status. This is very true. And he even mentions here, again, and for a time, free black people could even own the services of white indentured servants in Virginia. Free blacks owned slaves in Boston by 1724 and in Connecticut by 1783. By 1790, 48 black people in Maryland owned 143 slaves. One particularly notorious black Maryland farmer named Nat Butler regularly purchased and sold Negroes for the southern trade. So here you have a slave trader who's black in Maryland. <laughs> Nobody talks about this stuff. The only people you hear about are these uh, infamous slave traders in Richmond. Again, I was listening to the black lecture, and he, he points this out. Well, in Richmond... Uh, and, and in D.C., you had these notorious or infamous slave trading houses, and I read the books, and these people made a lot of money. Well, they did, and that was the most despicable part of, of slavery. And even uh, slave owners themselves did not like the slave traders. But, of course, the interesting thing about that, there was one of the most prominent slave traders in South Carolina, and there were a number of them there, it was a man named Nathaniel Russell. His house still sits in downtown Charleston, uh, I believe on um, Meeting Street, but I, I, I don't know. I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyways, Russell was from Rhode Island, and he, was, he moved to Charleston because he had contacts in Rhode Island, and, and a lot of slaves, in fact, the majority of slaves, would arrive in places like Newport, Rhode Island first, and then they would be shipped to the south because the north was heavily involved in the slave trade itself. Uh, so this is the unknown part of, of slavery as well in the slave trade. Uh, 
And then Gates goes on, perhaps the most insidious or desperate attempt to defend the right of black people to own slaves was the statement made on the eve of the Civil War by a group of free people of color in New Orleans, offering their services to the Confederacy in part because they were fearful of their own enslavement. And this is a quote from that. The free colored population, native of Louisiana, own slaves, and they are dearly attached to their native land, and they are ready to shed their blood for her defense. They have no sympathy for abolitionism, no love for the North, but they have plenty for Louisiana. They will fight for her in 1861 as they fought to defend New Orleans from the British in 1814 and 1815. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. You had black people fighting in the War of 1812 for the South? No. Hypocrisy. No, that can't be true. Of course, it was true. And if you go back to the colonial period, you find in South Carolina, you had black militia members who were defending uh, South Carolina in the Yemassee War. And uh, they in South Carolina actually appealed at one point to Virginia. We said, look, we need more we need more soldiers. Send us down some some black soldiers. And they were told at that point by Virginia, well, we can't really do that unless you send us some women. And South Carolina said no. And they said no because they said, well, wait a second. We can't do that because these women are married to these men down here, these black men. And if we do that, uh, that's going to disrupt families. Again, wait a second. I thought slaves couldn't get married. I thought they couldn't carry firearms. Here they are in Louisiana, in New Orleans, in 1814 and 15, carrying firearms. Oh, no way. When they've done some work in um, in and around uh, Jefferson's plantation, Monticello, they found that slaves there had firearms. Well, that was against the law. But wait a second. They had them. How did that happen? So this is, this is the interesting part about Southern history. It's much more complex. And if we can just get to the root of that complexity, I think we can get over all this PC stuff because we'll say, okay, well, we had a complex history in the South. There was this bad, of course, but there's also this uh, exception to the rule, perhaps. Or maybe the rule wasn't really the rule. Uh, we have to look at that. And, of course, Gates says, these guys, to put it bluntly, were opportunist par excellence. Because once the war broke out, some of these same black men formed 14 companies of a militia composed of 440 men and were organized by the governor in May 1861 into the Native Guards, Louisiana, swearing to fight to defend the Confederacy. Although given no combat role, the guards, reaching a peak of 1,000 volunteers, became the first Civil War unit to appoint black officers. Now, that did not happen in the Union Army <laughs> until the 20th century in the United States Army. But here you are in the South with black officers. Wow. Uh, so this, this whole process is much more complex. 1,000 men. Now, of course, he points out that when New Orleans fell in April of 1862, about 10% of these men, not missing a beat, formed the Native Guard Corps d'Afrique to defend the Union. But, here's a quote, Joel Rogers, he quotes Joel Rogers, the Negro slave owners, like the white ones, fought to keep their chattels in the Civil War. Rogers also notes that some black men, including those in New Orleans at the outbreak of the war, fought to perpetuate slavery. Or maybe they were just fighting to defend New Orleans. It could be that too. So, and then he gets into statistics. And we'll talk about this with, uh, with uh, the Coger book uh, in South Carolina. But he says, in the year 1830, about 13.7% of the black population was free. Of these... 3,776 free Negroes owned 12,907 slaves out of a total of about 2 million slaves. So it's a very small percentage of slavery. Again, I said this is not a huge percentage. But uh, The Known World of Free Black Slave Hunters, it's an essay by Thomas Presley, he calculated that 54 of these black slave owners owned, in 1830, owned between 20 and 84 slaves. 172, about 4% of these people, owned between 10 and 19 slaves. And 94% of these people owned between 1 and 9 slaves. And he said 42% owned just one slave. So again, it's not a large 
percentage of the population. But when you look at uh, in states, now you break this down. Presley also shows that the percentage of free black slave owners as a total as a total number of free black heads of families was quite high in several states. Forty three percent of free blacks in South Carolina owned slaves. 40% in Louisiana, 26% in Mississippi, and 25% in Alabama, and 20% in Georgia. So why do these people own slaves? He says it's reasonable to conclude that, 40, that the 42% of free black owners who own just one slave probably owned a family member. But... And he says, benevolent Negroes often purchase slaves to make their lot easier by granting them their freedom for a nominal sum or by permitting them to work it out on liberal terms. In other words, these black slave owners, the clear majority, cleverly used the system of slavery to protect their loved ones. But not all did, he said. And he quotes John Hope Franklin. Without doubt, there were those who possessed slaves for the purpose of advancing their own well-being. These Negro slave owners were more interested in their, making their farms or carpenter shops pay than they were in treating their slaves humanely. For these black slave owners, he concludes, there was some effort to conform to the pattern established by the dominant slave owning group within the state and the effort to elevate themselves to a position of respect and privilege. In other words, Gates says, most black slave owners probably own family members to protect them, but far too many turn to slavery to exploit the labor of other black people for profit. So then he gets into the what he calls the rogues gallery of black history. And he mentions a number of these slave owners uh, from different states who own slaves. And the first, uh, he mentions a man named John Carruthers Stanley. He was uh, born a slave in Craven County, North Carolina. Um, and he was ex an extraordinarily successful barber and speculator in real estate. Uh, by the early 1820s, he owned three plantations and 163 slaves and even hired three white overseers to manage his property. He had six children with a slave woman named Kitty, and he eventually freed them. But um, this man, this black man, John Carruthers Stanley, owned 163 slaves in North Carolina. Now, again, how can a black man, if slaves can't own property, even black people can't own property, how did this guy do this? Uh, but he did. Uh, he, so that's an interesting one. And we'll get into um, uh, to some others when we look at Larry Coger. Uh, a couple of the he mentions there. Uh, he mentions a man named Andrew Dun Durnford. He was a sugar planter and a physician. A physician! A doctor. A black doctor in, in, in New Orleans. Uh, and he owned, uh, he paid $7,000 for several male slaves, five female slaves and two children. He traveled all the way to Virginia in the 1830s and purchased 24 more. Eventually, he would own 77 slaves. When a fellow, fellow Creole slave owner liberated 85 of his slaves and shipped them off to Liberia, Dunford commented that he couldn't do that because, quote, self-interest is too strongly rooted in the bosom of all that breathes the American atmosphere. So he couldn't do it. <clears throat> so you had a large number of Slaves, in some cases, owned by free blacks. Now, again, small percentage of the total amount of you know, only of two million slaves. You're looking at a very small percentage, but still, you did have free black slave owners. This kind of blows apart the very simplistic narrative of Southern history. But then he says, even when you had Gates gets, he says very interestingly, even when you had uh, people buying family members, it wasn't always for the good of those family members. And so he gives you several quotes. He said, a free black in Trimble Co County, Kentucky, sold his own son and daughter south for $1,000, the other for $1,200. A Maryland father sold his slave children in order to purchase his wife. A Columbus, Georgia black woman, Dilsey Pope, owned her husband. And when he offended her in some way, she sold him. Fanny Kennedy of, Lou of Louisville, Kentucky, owned her husband Jim, a drunken cobbler, whom she threatened to sell down the river. At New Bern, North Carolina, a free black wife and son purchased their slave husband father. When the newly bought father criticized his son, the son sold him to a slave trader. The son boasted afterward that the old man had gone to the cornfields about New Orleans where they might learn him some manners. And so this is what Coger is going to say, too, and I'll get into Coger in a second. But Gates is being very honest in this piece and saying, look, this is a complex history. You know, this was after the beer summit. 
This is before the current PC hysteria that's now broken out in the South. Uh, so what are we to do now with this information? How are we to incorporate this into our very simplistic narrative about the South? And the other thing that tears that apart are th is this history of black Confederates. And so on Wednesday, we ran a piece by Clyde Wilson from the Clyde Wilson Library, Black Confederates. And it's actually two pieces combined into one. One published in uh, 1996, the other, I believe it was 2006, and they're from uh, his book, Defending Dixie. But he, he reviews uh, Black Confederates and Afro-Yankees in Civil War Virginia by uh, Irvin Jordan and also Larry Coger's book, uh, Black Slave Owners, Free Black Slave Masters in South Carolina. And so um, Clyde says, real life is always a little more complicated or a lot more complicated than ideological history. The image that most Americans carry around in their heads of the Old South and the, the black slavery that flourished over much of this continent for two and a half centuries is the cartoonish and largely misleading history. It is also, of course, extremely comforting to the mainstream American consciences to think of the heroic soldiers in blue marching forth to strike the chains from the suffering black people, setting aside the fact that emancipation did not become a war goal until, war, until well after hostilities had begun, and that in many cases it resulted only in destructive uprooting or a change of masters. So he gets into uh, Dr. Jordan's book first. Dr. Jordan's book presents a tremendous amount of documentation about the activities of black Virginians for and against the Confederacy. He is far from a Confederate sympathizer, which makes the data all the more telling. One considers that over large areas of the South, the black population was 70 to 90 percent, and most able-bodied white men were off fighting the war, and that nevertheless no uprisings or significant outrages occurred on the home front. One has to take a rather more complicated view of the Civil War than is usually pressed and passed around. It is true that many slaves left when they had the chance, when federal forces came near, but sometimes they had to be taken away by force. The attitudes of the blacks was not due to ignorance or lack of understanding, when Sherman burned over 100 blocks of Columbia, the winds that were said to have been responsible did not spare the homes of black people, though they did mysteriously jump over that of the French consul. The mayor of Columbia observed three Union soldiers shoot to death a black man they considered insolent. When he reported this to Sherman, he was told, we don't have time for court-martials and such. During Sherman's progress, blacks, like white civilians, were left without food and shelter, and black women were much more vulnerable than white women were to rape and murder. Jordan's book is not, only, is not the only one in this field of revisionism. The Journal of Confederate History a few years ago published an entire, entire issue, a symposium on black Southerners in gray. Well, Professor Edward C. Smith of American University and African American has produced two videotape lectures on the same subject. <clears throat> so then he gets into Coger, and we'll talk about Coger in a second. But he also says, he also mentions Kent Masterson Brown, who's an associated scholar of the Institute. He's a distinguished lawyer from Kentucky. Uh, he also, Brown completed a book on the Confederate retreat from Gettysburg. And Brown found that when the survivors came back from the picket Pettigrew charge, they returned to Confederate lines that were lined with black faces. Some 6,000 to 10,000 black men went with the army to Pennsylvania and back. The English observer uh, Colonel Fremantle saw a black Confederate marching a Yankee prisoner to the rear. He wondered at the reaction if, if the abolitionists in London could see that. Brown has found that many of those black men after Gettysburg took their wounded and dead masters home, sometimes to distant places in the far south. There's actually a historic marker in Fort Mitchell, Alabama, uh, on this particular topic. Uh, and I remember years ago I read on a website, uh, some far-left website, uh, criticizing this. Well, this is just uh, not true. These, these people didn't do this. Uh, this is just fabricated. This stuff didn't happen. That's interesting because there's documentation of it. Uh, but this is, this is what happens uh, when, you, when you start blowing apart the narrative that just doesn't fit political correctness. Uh, it's also important to note there was a, a book uh, written on uh, Camp Douglas and uh, the, 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 there was a History Channel actually did a documentary on this entitled 80 Acres of Hell. And the, the man who wrote the book mentioned that there was an instance at Camp Douglas where two, uh, uh, well, there were more than that. I think there was a handful of, uh, of black Confederates who were brought to Camp Douglas for, as prisoners of war. And there was an unwritten rule at Camp Douglas that these people didn't know that if you saw a black Southerner wearing Confederate gear, the uniform, 
You were to shoot him on sight, and that happened. So this black Confederate walks in wearing the Confederate kepe. He's he's in uniform, and he's shot dead by the prison guards at Camp Douglas, a Union prison. Well, that's there. That's tolerance, isn't it? Clyde goes on to say, it's hard for current folks to accept, but relations between blacks and whites in the South were sometimes familial. In soldiers' letters, it is sometimes difficult to determine whether people mentioned are family members or servants. <clears throat> and then he goes on, the American myth would have you think that the righteous soldiers in blue and the liberated slaves rushed into each other's arms. Nothing can be further from the truth. We can understand the black Confederate better if we understand that liberation by the Yankees is not always a positive experience. Southerners owned slaves and believed in white supremacy. But, as many former foreign observers pointed out, they were not as militantly racist as Northerners. In general, Yankees were more interested in getting rid of black people than in freeing them. Letters of Northern soldiers who in, were encountering black people for the first time make the biggest collection of racist literature before Goebbels. And he mentions that Illinois, of course, had laws of which Lincoln approved for forbidding black people to even settle in the state. And those who lived there had, uh, had no civil rights. The Union, he said, was fighting for power, not freedom and equality. When black soldiers were enlisted, it was because they, uh, they feared that, uh, because they freed that number of white men from risking their lives. When farms, houses, food, livestock, crops were deliberately destroyed by an invading army whose policy is to demoralize civilians, black people as well as white were left starving. So, uh, this again is a, it, it presents a much more complex picture of Southern history during the war and even before the war. And then on, on Thursday we had the introduction to Larry Coger's book, Black Slave Owners. It's a very short little piece. But he mentions... Uh, and I, this particular essay does not have a a very interesting quote by Coger, but he mentions some of these uh, large slave owners, and one I'm going to talk about in particular. Uh, but he says, uh, Coger says, in 1860, for example, uh, August Donato, a free colored planter of St. Landry Parish in Louisiana, owned 70 slaves who worked 500 acres of land and produced 100 bales of cotton. About 600 miles to the east of Louisiana in the, country, in the county of Sumter, South Carolina, William Ellison, a free colored planter, used the labor of 70 slaves to cultivate 100 bales of cotton in 1861. In South Carolina, Robert Michael Collins and Margaret Mitchell Harris used their slaves to toil the soil of Santee Plantation and grew 240,000 pounds of rice. But the majority of the large colored planters lived in Louisiana. In 1860, Madame uh, Cyprien Ricard and her son Pierre, free mulattoes of Iberville Parish, owned 168 slaves. The joint operation of mother and son used the labor of slaves to produce 515 hogshead of sugar in 1859. And he says, yet not all the black masters were planters or from the South. In fact, the, New York, the city of New York had eight black slave owners who owned 17 slaves in 1830. In short, he says, the institution of black slave owning was widespread, stretching as far north as New York and as far south as Florida, extending westward into Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Missouri. So I want to talk about uh, Ellison. Ellison was the most notorious slave owner in his district. In fact, he engaged in slave breeding, uh, which was frowned upon all throughout the South. He, he bred slaves for sale. Uh, this was considered to be immoral and inhumane. But Ellison, a free black man, did it. Uh, you also, not, one person who's often mentioned in this is a man named Horace King, uh, Horace King was a slave. He was an engineer his, his, uh, in, and lived in the Columbus, Georgia area, but he was freed, and he actually worked for the Confederacy uh, pro providing lumber on contract during the war. Now, he, he didn't support the Confederacy, but he worked for the Confederacy because he lived in Georgia, and so he provided lumber from his sawmills to build the CSS Jackson, uh, and um, again, a free black who's working for the Confederacy. Uh, now, he questions, you know, where do these people come from? Coger said, now, Coger is also, he has a master's degree from Howard University. He's also an, also an African-American. Um, he says, where, where do these people come from? Many of them were former slaves who were manumitted because of their kinship ties to whites, while others were emancipated for notorious military duty, faithful service, or saving a life, as well as for other reasons. Wait, military duty? Wait a second, how did that work? 
But the majority of the black masters never knew the dehumanization of slavery because they had been born for a free black parents. However, the ranks of the slave masters included not only free blacks, but also nominal slaves. In many instances, blacks who were not legally emancipated assimilated into the free black community and later became slave owners. By and large, the community of black masters came from a diverse background, which included persons of free and slave status. Once freed, the black masters obtained slaves by various methods. Many of the colored slave owners inherited slaves from black relatives as well as white kinsfolk. A few black masters owned slaves in West Africa and transported the slaves to the New World. But the majority of the black slave owners used their own industry and work as artisans, entrepreneurs, and even as unskilled laborers to obtain the capital to buy slaves. Coger actually says in the book that the majority of black slave owners, this is going to contrast Gates, he said, no, the majority of black slave owners were in this for economic reasons. They weren't in it for humanitarian concern. He says at the end of this introduction, yet black slave owning in South Carolina was primarily a commercial venture and the attitudes and actions of colored masters appeared to be similar to those of white slave owners. In essence, free black masters embraced many of the attitudes of the white community even while they remained on the fringe of society. But these people who were buying slaves were from all kinds of occupations. Uh, They were free blacks who worked as uh, draymen, stable keepers, uh, washerwomen, and they were using money to purchase slaves. So again, a very complex part of Southern history. And this book by Coger, it's it's really good. Now it's dry. It's got a lot of tables. It's a, it's a it's a monograph. It's a scholarly monograph. It's not just some flippant little piece of uh, of history, you know, popular history. It is very good. It's actually republished by the University of South Carolina Press in 2011. Um, it's a very good very good book. Uh, and you won't get it though. In your uh, in your graduate level history seminars, it's not assigned, um, and it should be. I mean, when you when you you should assign this, uh, as well as you know books by Genovese, Eugene Genovese, and um, Fogel and Engerman's Time on the Cross, among others. I mean, this should be uh, required reading for graduate students because it provides a much more complex history of slavery in the South. The last piece. Was actually is actually a chapter from uh, the book by uh, Howard Ray White and Clyde Wilson, editors, Understanding the War Between the States. It's available for free online. It's linked in the article itself. But the title of the book is Black Soldiers North and South, 1861 to 1865. This is chapter 27 from that particular book. Uh, and it was written by uh, a, a man named... Uh, Earl L. I. James, and uh, he is the curator of African American history at the North Carolina Museum of History, and he's also the co-producer of the documentary video, Colored Confederates. And at the end of the piece, there's a YouTube uh, video trailer, uh, which has won several awards on black Confederate soldiers. He's featured in the video. And um, this is an interesting piece because he gets into not only uh, black Americans who fought for the Union, but also the number of black Americans who fought for the Confederacy. And I've already mentioned some of them there in New Orleans. But he he lists several known uh, black Confederate soldiers uh, and how several of these people were were included in Confederate veteran reunions. And so you find these pictures out there, Confederate veteran reunion, and you have black uh, people participating in that. There's actually a video on YouTube where they're interviewing a couple of these guys in the 1930s in a film and they talk about their experience as black Confederates. Uh, and so this part is often overlooked, an often overlooked part of, of Southern history. And those that do focus on it will say, well, this is just a, I mean, this is a minor part of, I mean, the, most blacks didn't serve in the Confederacy, and they were actually rejected. And this is, this is true as well. Uh, there was an attempt several times, near the end of the war in particular, to enlist black soldiers into the Confederate Army. It was rejected uh, by the Confederate government until the very end. And then there was a black regiment raised, raised in Richmond for the defense of the Confederacy. Though we do know that, for example, Bedford Forrest uh, had his slaves fighting with him and offered them their freedom. If you fight with me for the war, you will get your freedom. And that did happen. Uh, you had countless examples across the South of, uh, of slaves who did fight. And the, the, uh, the film uh, Ride with the Devil, which uh, came out 
in the late 90s. It's an Ang Lee film, and Ang Lee was more famous for Brokeback Mountain, which uh, dealt with uh, homosexual uh, activity. Uh, but uh, he was, So he's an award-winning director. He produced this film before that. Uh, and um, he had in this film Jeffrey Hunt, who is a very good actor, playing a black confederate. And so the film, it had uh, Tobey Maguire in it, who was um, you know, now a famous actor, played Spider-Man, had Jewel, the famous singer Jewel, very great, uh, just an amazing voice. But she was in it. And it was blacklisted because of Jeffrey Hunt playing the black confederate and because of the period language. They freely used language of the time, which included some terms that people don't want to hear anymore. Uh, and so it was um, it was blacklisted. You had to get it in you know small kind of artsy movie theaters if you wanted to watch it. It came out on DVD. It is out there, uh, and it's the story of the war in Missouri. It also had Jim Caviezel in it. Uh, Jim Caviezel, who was later on uh, in The Passion of the Christ as Jesus, uh, has now in a very popular television show, uh, Person of Interest, which is an interesting show, but uh, had some really famous actors uh, and... A wonderful movie, uh, excellent movie, in fact. Uh, so I'd highly recommend that, but you did have this black confederate. Uh, so, again, the war and, and race and race relations in the South, much more complex than what is, is portrayed in your very simplistic, stupid is the better word, modern uh, history courses, all the way up to Ivy League institutions. Uh, if we get to the complexity, and people don't like com- complex because it's harder to understand. It's harder to understand. Uh, simple is easy. Just give me the answer so I can write it down the test. Give me the one-word answer. And again, Blight gets into this. And it's funny how he talks about it because he says, well, I was on this uh, radio show because I'm so important. I wrote this book. This is from 2008. I wrote this book, and everyone wanted to talk to me about it because <laughs> I'm David Blight, and I teach at Yale. And, uh, I mean, I do these things all the time. And so I go on this radio show. I was on this public broadcasting show in Minnesota, and it it was good. But then I go on this radio show in Tennessee, and I got these guys on there. I don't know what their names are, like Bob and Jim. And uh, Bob and Jim, these hayseeds, start asking me, uh, tell me what the war was about. And oh, I have to talk about it in a soundbite. You know how hard that is to do in a soundbite? And he says, well, I just said this. I just said it was all about slavery. And, of course, the students in Yale uncomfortably laugh. Ha, ha, ha. You hear that in the background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Blight is up there talking about how great he is. I'm so great. Look at me. I've written, uh, you know, I've written some books on on this stuff, and I, I know everything. And it just comes down to this. Now he does say that, in, in, essentially implying in this that it's I couldn't do it because the war is much more complex. And so he does give it that. But if I had to boil it down, it's just this. That's it. The one word answer: slavery. And that's all it is. Uh, so this is what. This is why complexity blows up that narrative and uh, blows up the simplistic narrative of the war in the South and what Southern history was. And so that's why we ran these pieces this week. Again, not overemphasizing these things, but just giving it a little bit of flavor, throwing a little wrench in the simplistic narrative. And if you, you know, when you look at the, the current problems we face in Southern history and current problems we face with the narrative of the South and the current problems we face... Anything like the Abbeville Institute, I mean, you know, uh, when, when, when you say we're going to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, oh, so you're going to explore uh, race and slavery. No, we're not going to explore that. That's not what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, but if you want to talk about it, it's a little more complex than what you say. Uh, and so, you know, th- this is the elephant in the room, so to speak. So we can talk about what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. If you want to talk about what's true and valuable in, in Western civilization, you have to talk about the Greeks and the Romans, which were also slaveholding societies. And yet, we can talk about what they contributed to Western civilization, which is so much of it, in fact, all of the early underpinnings of it, uh, then and we can divorce that from... If we can talk about Aristotle, whose book Politics is loaded with references to slavery, and we can say... Uh, well, we can talk about this and Aristotle and the good things that he brought to Western civilization. Why can't we talk about that with the South? Why can't we say, okay, well, I mean, they had that. And we don't have that anymore. We don't have slavery anymore. We've gotten past that. Uh, but there are things that they, they talked about which were important for living a better life, uh, whether it was uh, Christian humility at times or uh, whether it was Christianity in general and how to be a man. 
how to, how to live a proper life as a man, um, whether it was the Jeffersonian tradition, the respect for the environment, self-determination, local self-government, these type of things. These are the things that we can carry forward. As Weaver said, we may not want to live in the Old South, but the Old South can teach us how to live in the New South. And if we understand our complex history, that becomes a lot easier in race relations as well, in the New South. An understanding between people breeds happiness. And if it's always contentious, if it's always this very simplistic narrative of moral right versus moral wrong, that breeds contention and hostility. And that's not what we want to do. So breeding uh, understanding brings consensus between people. And that's what we should be striving to do. And I, 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 uh, I will say I respect Gates for doing that in that particular essay, Did Black People Own Slaves? Because he was trying to do that and saying, look, history is a little more complex here. You need to understand this. Uh, and same thing with Coger. Uh, so uh, same thing with I James. I James. So you, you, you have uh, people who are out there saying, wait a second, wait a second now. We, we, we're getting off the rails here. It's a little more complex than that. So that's why we have the Abel Institute just to, to just discuss what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Until next time, good day. Mm-hmm.